Okay, tonight we're going to talk about the seven things that are opened in the book of Revelation. I'll repeat it again, the seven things that are opened in the book of Revelation. It's very important, the sequence. So hang on to it and play cl pay close attention. First, we're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 19. And the angel answered, answering, said unto him, this would be Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be done. You're not going to be able to open your mouth. Do you know why? You want to remember this. If God, his, his elect must be prepared to allow the Holy Spirit to speak, you will be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. So there you have it. Always when you know better, then don't turn your back on God. Don't be a disbeliever. He doesn't like it. Now, skip on to, the, to verse uh, 64. John the Baptist is born. And he wrote a note saying, call him John. What we're doing here is Zacharias is about to make a prophecy from the Holy Spirit. And he basically tells you the seven things that are open. It is amazing how our Father works in the Word. Okay. So let's read it. Verse 64. And his mouth, this was after the birth, and his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God, and fear came on all that dwelt around about them, and all the, these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. That word traveled fast. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Verse 67, here's why we came here. And his father, Zacharias, Zacharias in the Hebrew tongue means remembered by Yah. So certainly this man was remembered by the living God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, this prophecy is very important. Again, it leads to the seven things open in the book of Revelation. And, and he prophesied, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited, underlined visited in your mind, and redeemed his people. 69, and hath raised up an horn of salvation. That would be through the Son, of course. For, for us in the house of his servant David. And as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. How long, how long have they been there? How long has God provided us prophets? Since the world began. There's no need in anyone being left out. As long as you will study the prophets when it's truly one speaking with the Holy Spirit. Then we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us. Let that comfort you. That prophecy still stands to this day. When you love the Lord and you follow him, you're his child. Number one, he's given you power over all your enemies. Now, you don't want to be a wimp, do you? No, you use it. 
But when you've done all you can, he's going to step in. He's your father. Verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. That's to remember his contract. You should remember it. Who did he make it to? Um, verse 73, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. What was that oath? That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in reverence and without fear you don't have to worry about it this is why you know for a christian to doubt a promise of god is weak okay if god makes the promise you claim it you live it you talk to him and you expect it okay in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. And John the Baptist was. He was the last prophet before Christ. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And he did. He was that voice crying from the wilderness uh, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Oh, he was good at it. They came from miles down to the ford on the Jordan to be baptized. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. This word day spring in the Hebrew is a mach, which means the branch. And that branch, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist being the forerunner thereof to announce the coming. And how precious it is that his father gave this prophecy, even at once having refused to speak and believe. And he being a priest himself of the course of Abaya, he refused. And he was struck dumb because of it. Don't mess with God. Listen to Him. Love Him. Trust Him. And you'll do just fine. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. Now the seven things that are opened in the book of Revelation. And the sequence in which they come is very important to you. It lets you know what God wants you to have foremost on your mind. The word revelation itself means to open. It means to unveil. You're supposed to understand the book of Revelation. So let's add this stepping stone of the seven things open, the sequence and their importance. Go with me to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And you're fortunate tonight. We're going to stay in the book of Revelation now. <laughs> you're home there, okay? We're going to open it up. All right. well, let's go to the first opening. What was it? Chapter 4, verse 1, Revelation. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a thunder talking with me. That's the voice of God, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. You know, that's what we're interested in. That door was opened. And John was told to walk in. Why? To show us things that will happen before that day of the Lord. If you go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, you find out that this happens on the day of the Lord, which means the millennium, a thousand-year period. He said, I'm going to tell you what's going to transpire so you're not anxious about it. 
Verse 2, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. Verse 3, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper or a sword or a stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. It was the real thing. It wasn't the fake imitation that later will come. This was your father and the very sharp kind of glory that ringed that throne that brought forth the fact this is our father. Verse 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Those are the same 24 that prophesied in the lecture today, this morning early. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. If you want to know what those spirits are, it's a little, little takes away from it, but not necessarily. You'll find them in chapter 5, verse 12. The seven spirits of God, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, one, and riches, two, wisdom, three, strength, four, honor, five, glory, six, and blessings, of course, seven. Now, now go with me to chapter 6, verse 1. I want you to stop and think a moment. He has opened the door to heaven. What is the first thing he's going to tell us? Would you say the first thing is probably one of the most important? Absolutely. Naturally. The first thing, the first door opened is very important to us. And we find that door opened in chapter 6, verse 1. This is the second door. But the first opened after heaven. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. And one of the four beasts, the living creatures, saying, Come and see. I want you to look at this. I want you to absorb it. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. This crown is tuxon in the Greek tongue. It means a cheap imitation fabric. It's the Antichrist. So now, now think a moment in sequence. What is the most important thing the Father wanted you to know in the opening series? The Antichrist is coming. And he's going to be riding on a white horse, but didn't we understand Christ would also? You know, that's why he's the Antichrist. And that's why it is ever important that you know and understand that that God put it number two, at the first after opening the door the, to heaven, that you know who this one <clears throat> was <clears throat> and from whence he would come. Now, what would number three be? Well, I don't know. Let's go to nine, chapter 9, verse 2, and, and we'll find out. Chapter 9... Let's read verse 1 first. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from, from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. What was open third? And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So what was this third one? Again, it's the coming of the Antichrist. 
He does not wish you to be deceived. He's jealous. He loves you. And he doesn't want you hanging around with a fake. He wants you to be brighter than that. He wants you to be touched by the Holy Spirit that you can recognize a phony when you see one. Because, beloved, there are a lot of phonies in this world. Verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Verse 4, listen carefully. What does he do about his children? And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, but wait, that's what locusts eat. Neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Why? He's not going to let them touch you. Why? Because you have the seal of God in your forehead. You understand the openings in heaven. You understand what it is God would have you know with understanding the importance and the sequence of events whereby you're not deceived. And verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. You all know what that means. Turns your backbone to mush. Verse 6, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. You know, you might say, well, how, how, why would someone seek death? How would you like to be a church member that sit on a church pew all your life, loving the Lord, but never being really taught the Word? I mean, you're genuine. You love Him. And then to find out that you've been in the sack with Satan, the Antichrist, that you turned your back on the one you really love, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're too ashamed to face him. And you would pray for death because you would be too ashamed to, to walk in the presence of this Holy One. Verse 7, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. Those crowns are turbans, as you well know. And their faces were as the faces of men. Well, how, how could that be? Because they were men. The men of the world. And, but Antichrist will use whomever he can. And boy, has he got a lot of people for religious reasons that do things that are straight out of the pits of hell. His children blowing themselves up. Things that, that that's, you know, that's, totally out of the realm of reason, of love of God. But there you have it. Antichrist will use whomever he chooses. Remember the sequence. That was number three. Both of those were concerning the false messiah. Now, let's go to a chapter we were at this morning. Let's go to 11, chapter 11, verse 19. Verse 19 reads, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of the, his testament. This is what Zacharias was talking about, the covenant. And there were lightnings, and voices, thunders, and an earthquake, and great hail. How precious it is that our Father provides us. That what is open there? The testimony. God's Word. If you look at it calmly with understanding, absorbing it what the Spirit would say to you, keeping things in order, everything in its own priority, to know who the true Christ is 
it's not that difficult in what the fraud is. You can tell a fraud today when you see one. It's re- well, how do I know? If they don't align with God's word after you've made a, a simple study. Um, let's, uh, let's go ahead to chapter 15, verse 5. Same subject, chapter 15, verse 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. That's number five. It's opening up when you search and when you seek and when you pray for knowledge and guidance. Father will always give it to you. Why? Well, it's simple. He loves you. Why? I don't know. (laughs) But I do know. He loves you because you're you, because you care. I just wanted to see if you were awake, okay, (laughs) out there, all right? But he loves you and he does care and he wants you to absorb his word. Don't be like Zacharias and say, well, I know him, but I just don't quite, you're dumb. You know, you don't want God to say that to you. That's not, not where you want to go. Okay, but that one was opened and that is the fifth one. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. He's about to move. He's going to, beloved, who lived forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels was fulfilled. And of course, what that has to do with is is the fact that um, that, um, he, our heavenly father, he wants you to see the truth. And the temple will be closed white. Those that are in the wrong side of the book are going to be educated through the millennium. That's what, it, it's closed. If by the time the vials start being poured, pretty well, if, if you haven't been convinced, you're, you've almost waited one day too late, just like they did at Kadish Barnier. Okay, now, let's go to 1911 to see what number six might be. 1911. This is one of the most important openings. It separates Christians from non-Christians. Verse 11, chapter 19, the great book of Revelation. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. Well, my goodness, we saw that back in 6-1, didn't we? Yes, we did. But don't you ever think it's the same white horse? It isn't. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He's not coming to be crucified. He's coming to make war. His eyes were a flame of fire and his head was, were, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Verse 13, and he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's his name. Do you know it? Do you know the Word of God? I mean, the Word of God became flesh and walked among us. The same rider of this white horse. And do you know something? He was, it was spoken of long ago in the Old Testament. In Zechariah chapter 9, 9, it says he's going to come riding lowly on an ass or the colt of an ass. Never ridden before. But in verse 10, he comes on a white stallion to conquer the second advent. And that's what we're in, just about to approach 
we're getting close. That's why we have to take these ABCs of the sixth, seventh, and the, the remainders of the fifth and study them with understanding to keep the sequence in order. When it happens, it's going to happen fast. But you will recognize that. Why? Because you studied the Word. You know the man on the white horse. It's the Word of God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, He loves you. Verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. He's not going to be alone. He's bringing a lot of your families with him. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. They're pure. And they're ready to cleanse this earth to assist God's saints in doing that the elect that are here. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he as he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. That's who he is. Can you imagine that he, the only begotten, the Word of God, leads you, he wants you, he wants you to love him because he certainly loves you. He has a plan. And this is how you understand his plan is by looking at the sequence of these end times. You know, the prophets even wanted to live where you're living today. They wanted to witness this. And before your very eyes, it's happening. It's happening all over the world. Wake up. Observe it. Have the sequence straight. God said to you, most important thing, don't you be sucker baited. Don't, don't you be taken in by the false one. Beloved, you know something? A lot of people that call themselves Christians are going to think he is come to fly them away. That, that is sad. I get no pleasure from that. That's why we must do our best to see that the truth prevails. And we drag as many as we can out of the filthy hands of Satan. And that is the sequence of things up to, the, up to this particular one. And, uh, and so it is that uh, as that great name. To conclude this lecture, a little short, but that's the end of it. I was taught as a young minister is when you have explained the four W's, what, when, where, and what, why, sit down, <laughs> shut up. You got it done. So that's what we're about to do here now. We're going to do the seventh one. Go with me to the 20th chapter, the 10th verse. Chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil deceived them that was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night and forever and ever. They're blotted out. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Time ends. And here comes your seventh, okay. the seventh opening in the book of Revelation. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Not their faith. 
their works. Do you know, after him going overboard to warn you about the false Christ, if your works are to worship him, do you think he wants you? Do you think Christ would want you? Not under those conditions, not at all. He wants you to be true to him. It's not that difficult. He, he lets you know who the enemy is. Don't mess around with the enemy. You'll always lose if you do. Stay true to your heavenly father. Those books, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful, uh, but they gang up on me and there I am at the book. No, uh-uh. God is fair. What's in that book? You did it. It's all your baby. Okay. And that's why you sure want to repent when you mess up. Otherwise, it's in the book. And that's the last thing to be opened. And what good news that's going to be for some and what sad news for others. You know, the dead, God is not the God of the dead. The dead are those that have not overcome. You're living. You have eternal life. You're in the book and you have rewards there. Not in something negative. It's judgment day. The books are opened and there's your name. One that would never bow a knee to Baal. One that would never be taken in by the false Christ because you knew the sequence of openings in the book of the unveiling, the book of Revelation. And you stayed true right to the last minute. It was important to you. It's more important to him. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Don't, is it, the works count, my friend. That's the only thing you can take with you because that's what you're judged by. Faith is wonderful. That's what gives you the strength and the ability to follow. But you've got to get into the word. That's his name. Verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Beloved, that is the death of the soul of those that didn't make it. They're gone. They're erased. They're blotted out. You will never shed a tear for them because you will even, for, blotted out means out of your mind, they don't exist. 15 to conclude. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So there you have it. The seven openings. Don't forget the first two and even three. It's the Antichrist. He thought it important enough to put in chapter 6, verse 1, the white horse, that's the fraud. Because he did not want you deceived. He wants you to stand and above all stand against sin, to stand against deception, the deception that is coming. Even now, it's knocking on the door. Don't let it in. Because you have been warned from the book of Revelation. The seven things this morning and the seven openings this evening. God wants us to be warned. He wants us to love him. And you know what? I love you all too. I do. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. 
The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Where in the Bible can I find if you have seen me, you have seen the Father? Well, we, we just finished the book of John, and you'll find it in the 14th chapter, where Christ was talking to the disciples, not the multitude, and, and he told them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin shall conceive, bear a child, and you will name him Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. So, in other words, God himself is in a dimension that we cannot see in flesh bodies. In spiritual bodies, you bet we can see him. But in flesh bodies, we cannot see that dimension. Therefore, God saw fit to let the word become flesh and walk among us where we could see it and see him. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. John chapter 14. Uh, Robert from Indiana, where can I find in the Bible the part that talks about how we can keep, can help our loved ones who are on the wrong side of the gulf? Thank you. Um, and naturally, Ezekiel from chapter 40 to the end is all about the millennium. And when you go to chapter 44, verses 20 through 25, it stipulates if you are one of God's elect, okay, zadok, which is a Hebrew word that means the just, the upright, the elect, then you can go dress a person down to assist them, to get their act together, teach a little discipline, and uh, so it is. David from Florida, I was wondering if you ever studied Aramaic the idioms and figures of speech in the Bible by George Lamsa and his ideas in the Bible. Yes, I have, of course. I have all of Lamsa's work, and, and um, his idioms are especially good. Uh, Cecil from Tennessee. Pastor, can you verify that Satan is still locked up in heaven? Many people say he is here on earth. It's because they can't separate spirit from actuality. He, will, he is locked in heaven as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. He will be locked there until Michael and his angels throw him out. They cast him out here on earth where he comes as Antichrist. Now, his evil spirit has always been traversing the earth. I mean, he can influence you. As a matter of fact, he is the evil spirit called the lunar, lunar tech. And uh, it's, it's, it's a bad spirit. But he will de facto be cast out onto the earth as an individual. That's a role he's wanted to play as Messiah. And that's what the false Christ is, is the false Messiah. Uh, Don from Arizona. To the best of our knowledge, what year did the original temple fall to the Babylonian Empire? Well, the, the ten northern tribes were taken at 600 A.D. And the remaining two tribes, with mainly the tribe of Judah, from the land of Judea, which is Jerusalem, were taken captive about 400 B.C., about 400 B.C. Uh, Dan from Connecticut. Pastor, please help me explain what Mark 13, 17 means till scriptures I can share with my wife. Well, you picked a scripture that is very important. You know, in, in Mark 13, you are given all seven signs of the seven seals, seven trumps, in the seven vials, as they come to pass in chronological order. 
And, and his main point then is in the 17th verse when he said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, then your main scripture to document that is to go back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where it shows Antichrist on earth that he prevents Holy Communion being taken. Why? He wants it to himself. And people that are ignorant will drink communion to him rather than to the true Christ. That will be shut off in the middle of the week. But then in the Hebrew, it's very specific. It is not desolation. It is desolator. Shun is a condition. Tor is an entity. And that entity is Satan cast out on earth. Uh, Daniel 9.27 uh, Rhonda what, from Michigan, what scripture in the Bible does it talk about Easter? Well, the translation is in Acts chapter 12 verse 4. But you won't find it in the manuscripts. The word Ishtar is nowhere in God's word other than as a pagan goddess. But the word Easter, as it's used in Acts 12, in the manuscripts, the word is Paschal, Paschal, which is Greek for Passover. Christ became our Passover. That's why you will never hear Shepherd's Chapel celebrating Easter. That's a pagan holiday. But we'll celebrate Passover. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Christ became our Passover. It doesn't get any better than that. Because if you love the Lord, just as in time of old, if you had the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost, the death angel had to pass over you. And if you have the blood of Christ through your partaking of Holy Communion, that same death angel must pass over you today and you can walk right into the Holy of Holies and enjoy eternal life. Uh, Gail from Virginia. Assuming we are still alive, question, will we be here when the two witnesses come or are already with God in our spiritual bodies? Well, we will, those that are not, that are still alive, naturally are going to see the two witnesses. They will be here. They come to God's elect. They guide, they direct, and as you read in Revelation chapter 11, they do some pretty awesome things. Why? Because they have the power of God with them to document that Satan is a fraud, that the spurious Messiah is exactly that, a fake. And uh, so it is. Question from, um, this would be from who? Uh, let's see, I've got a name here somewhere, I'll bet you. Chelsea, I'm nine years old. Well, bless you. Me and my mama and papa watch you. And it's you are amazing and God bless you and Dennis Murray. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We, we all do, okay? Let's see what your question is. What does the word Sheila mean? Uh, how, how do you pronounce the word? It is Sheila. And it is a musical term if you're applying it to the uh, Psalms. And, and the musical term means pause or stop the music. What it does, God will ask a question or make a statement, and then he will pause you. That means stop, meditate, think on that. And then he gives you the answer following the sila. Uh, the answer uh, is always there, and God is always complete. It's a precious way of teaching. And thank you for enjoying studying. Uh, this would be Glenn from Ohio. Question, when Christ told the apostles to wait 10 days for the Comforter, was the world without the, his Holy Spirit for that 10 days 
And do you think this is in connection between the 10 days of tribulation the elect go through at the time instead of, uh, uh, instead of Christ, meaning Revelation chapter 2, verse 9? That's something to think about. There is a 10-day period there. And certainly their orders were wait. When you are given orders to wait, that teaches patience. Why? Well, God said it. If God says wait, if Christ says wait, you wait. And uh, he'll take care of business. Why? We don't have to be talking at that time. He will. He'll take care of business. Um, SS from Canada. How does God feel about this? I have a friend that lost her mother a few years ago. Years are passed and she still don't want to let go of her mother's passing. She says if she lets go of her, she will feel that her world is coming to, is going to fall apart. She has a spirit, she has a spiritual wall put up around herself and her family. And she makes her friends feel like they are a, a piece of junk. Well, uh, you know, I think today's lecture, it's better to be in a house of mourning than in a house of feasting. Why? Because her mother's with the Lord. Her mother's rejoicing and having, she's happy. And I'm sure she sheds a tear because this one does not listen to God's word and celebrate eternal life. It's a shame. It is a shame for this person to let Satan get a hold of her and miss the very joy of the living God in her mother's good reputation and accepting eternal life. It doesn't end her if she's worried about her own will ending, she's selfish. Be happy for your mother and let God bring joy to your heart. You need it, that girl does. Uh, Shepherd's Chapel, John from Minnesota. Question, I understand the overall plan of God and that we will be with him for eternity. What I'm having a problem with is how was our father how our father was always. We had a beginning, but my brain can't understand that our father had no beginning. Please help. That's why he said, call me, I am that I am. That's the only question you're going to get answered on it. He is wherever he wants to be and wherever he wants to be. Adam, was he a new soul or was Adam in the world that was? He, no, he was made in the same image he was in the world before. God created all the souls in the first earth age. And, and here he brings them into the clay man because there were some of them lost. And he wants to give them an opportunity to be found. Uh, Ed from California. The, I would, I used the Fair Fenton for, from 1993 to 2011. Then I bought a companion Bible from you, and now I use it mostly. What is your opinion of the Fair Fenton? Thank you. It's, it's a good Bible. Fair Fenton, had, he knew the sacred name, and uh, he, was a, he was a pretty good scholar. There's nothing, you don't have to make any apologies for Fair Fenton. Helen from Georgia. Please explain 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3, 4, and 5. You know, those are some of the most misunderstood verses in God's Word. And mainly it has to do with people not accepting Leviticus chapter 11 or any of the health laws. They want to do whatever they want to do, and that will make you sick. Let's take the word, don't ever let any man judge you in marriage. That means don't let some church tell you that you can't, that if you've repented and been forgiven of all your sins, that you can't marry. They don't have that authority. And then it will say, 
or prevent you from eating what God created to be received. Now that's the key word. People read over that conveniently. God did not create all animals to be received. That's why you've got to go to Leviticus 11 to understand why. And then it would continue on down to verse 5 and say, all of God's animals are good. For what? For the purpose He created them to serve. He created scavengers not to eat, but to clean up the filth from the earth. You don't eat that filth or you become sick. So there you have it. Only that that God created to be received. Uh, Delma from, where is Delma from? From Georgia. Question, my son tells me that as there were no women in the first uh, earth age that I cannot be of um, Israel and that I cannot be an elect. He says he and his brother can be. How can he be of Israel and I, his mother, cannot be? I believe he is mistaken. He says, I can be a whomsoever will. Well, you let him know that you're an Israelite, okay? If you're one of the ten tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountains. And, uh, you know, that's a strange thing. I wonder, uh, poor, poor old, let's take Sarah as an example, Abraham's wife. God blessed her, and from her would come Israel. You know, so uh, your son needs to realize that God picks the tough souls from the first earth age and puts in female bodies, because females have to go through quite a bit more than males do, and and so it is that uh, they um, they're precious souls. No, don't, don't let him take that away from you. He's a little bit confused. Be patient with him. But you are one of God's elect, and be that as it may. Donna from Pennsylvania. Please explain the Rose of Sharon. Uh, also, where is Adumia? Isaiah 34. Well, let's take the last one first. Adumia in the Hebrew tongue means red. It means blood. Okay. It means Edom. It means rosh. And when you read in Ezekiel chapter 38, Chief Prince Meshach, that Chief Prince, Chief and the word Prince or Rush, R-O-S-H, that would later become Rush by the Volga and then Russia. So um, that's, that's what it means. The Edom would go north and that's where, uh, it, Genesis 27 documents that he would live in a north country that would be totally away from the fat of the land. I mean, he won't produce that far north like it will here, okay? Um, the Rose of Sharon um, is simply from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. It's those that Christ loves. He says, you're the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. God so loves his children that love him. And that's, that's what the cipher of that statement is. Uh, that's how God feels about his election. Uh, Jim from Oklahoma. In Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41, one was taken, one was left. Taken where? Please explain. Well, what's the subject? The subject is Antichrist here on earth pretending to be Christ. And so if they say he's in here, don't go. Don't be taken. Why? But you'd be taken by the Antichrist. The first one taken uh, in Matthew 24 is taken by Satan himself. Uh, you you want to be staying in the field working right up until the true Christ returns. So they are taken naturally into the greatest sin man can commit. It's called Satan worship. That's where they're taken. And you might even hear preachers say, I want to be one of those first ones taken. Yeah, Satan worship. 
Lack of scholarship, bad thing. Janice from Pennsylvania. Um, my I, my uh, son and two grandsons are Marines. I am proud of them and they know that God stands beside them to guide and to love them. Well, fantastic. I salute to, to your offspring there. Um, how long does it take to understand God's letter the way you do? Well, I've been at it for a lot of years, but also God gives gifts, okay? So don't, don't worry about it. As long as you've got the general plan, that's what, what is necessary. Uh, Marshall from Virginia. I'm a little confused about the taking away of the daily sacrifice and place there the abomination of desolation. The daily sacrifice, are they given in the temple of Jerusalem? It means holy communion. Satan wants it taken to himself. Okay, That's what it means, and the daily oblation it is called. But the abomination of desolation is the abomination of the desolator, meaning Satan stand, it's an abomination for Satan to stand in Jerusalem claiming to be Christ. That's what it means. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it makes His day when you read the letter that He has sent to you. And, and when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. You can count on it. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me, listen good. You stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.